Good evening, everyone. Good. Um, thank you for Collins. A uh, very structured way to talk about very, very deep things. God bless you tremendously. Thank you for the um, singers. May God bless you too. Uh, thank you for all of those who've come um, to the auditorium in person. Um, I do know today and tomorrow will be challenging days, given that we have a funeral we are attending. But thank you for all of those who've come. And yes, if you're online, um, watching this live or um, following up on the recorded version, we sincerely appreciate your time and company together. We're remaining with a few more um, days to go, I think three messages, including today, uh, for us to wrap up this series. You can follow up on the previous, and please also keep in touch with um, the rest. It's called The Church as a Hospital. Today's message is entitled, These Brothers Have Dementia. These Brothers Have Dementia. My, my elder brother is a nurse and a very funny person. I think one of the funniest people I know. And I remember um, once in a conversation with him and another friend of ours, he was talking about his rotation at the mental facility um, as part of the training. And of all the individuals who were in that mental facility, this particular patient was looking promising. They were able to have a, what looked like a coherent conversation. It was flowing nicely. Um, I think to a point he was even beginning to wonder, why is this person here? They, they sound like they're doing, they're doing well. Um, at that time, he was working in Kenya. And towards the end of the conversation, um, this patient even asked him, like, okay, so you're going home? He said, yeah, yeah, I'm going home. And he says, okay, um, just greet everyone at home. Please tell them, um, we, who are, we, we who are in Zambia, we are doing okay. That's when it dawned on him, like, whoa, this guy all along has been imagining he's in, he's in Zambia. His, his dementia is cheating him. Story two. When I joined high school, um, I studied in Kenya. We don't use, um, I, I noticed the U.S. uses years. Uh, we use, when you get to high school, we say form. So it's form one, form two, form three, form four. So when I joined form one, one of the, my classmates and who sat uh, pretty close to me was a very brilliant guy, very nice stories. He had humor to die for, uh, was very athletic. He'd even been, prior to joining high school, he'd even done a soccer commercial. Like he was, he was that good. But then by the time we were reaching the third year of high school, we call it Form 3, something just changed. One day he is caught breaking into somebody's um, property in school. The next day he is found squatting in school, looking all dirty and at a weird hour when he's not expected to be where he is near the classes. The next day he is found crying and everything. And of course, initially, we imagined um, he'd become a thief, but it very quickly became clear to us, this was not a case of somebody who was a thief. This was somebody who was struggling with something really serious mentally. It would later on emerge that he was, I think, having a curious case of cerebral malaria that had triggered very many um, dementia things. He'd forgotten who he was. Now, we, we could have stories um, to the end of the day about people whose, and, and the stories could be, they could range from funny to bizarre to sad to deadly, of individuals who've forgotten who they are, who are suffering from dementia. Dementia is one of the things that can make you forget who you are. And dementia is caused by anything that changes um, the brain chemistry and the brain physiology. So 
some diseases that cause accumulation of fluid in the brain can cause dementia, and some other diseases that cause um, brain degeneration could cause dementia. So you could get dementia from anything ranging from Alzheimer's to other degenerative conditions. The bit of dementia that I'm very usually curious about is the one that makes individuals not just forget events or, or persons, but it is the sort of dementia that makes people forget who they are. How, how somebody moves from being aware and confident and clear and completely uh, forgets who they are and having seen my own friend in uh, two years, um, I mean, not because this degeneration happened or like almost overnight, having watched him go down, it, it, it was fascinating um, to me, like, how does somebody forget who they really are? When people forget who they are, they do bizarre things. In the case of my friend, he, didn't, he, 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 he was not taking care of his hygiene. He was involving himself in risky behavior. He, was, he moved from a trustable friend to one who became a thief. Fast forward in the story, he did become well. When his malaria was treated, he became well. And like, <laughs> like high school boys, uh, once the danger was passed, it became a source of humor. It earned him a new nickname. Um, in, in Kenya, we call people who've lost their heads cheesy. That's the, uh, it's not the English way. Cheesy is not like, you know, like a nice beat. You know? In Kenya, when you say cheesy, it means somebody whose um, mental state is not stable. So my friend decided to begin calling himself Chisdom, which was wisdom combined with cheesy. So, and in a bizarre way, boys, um, boys do a lot of that. I, I have been legally blind from when I was nine. And the thing that helped me cope with my own legal blindness was my friends made a ton of fun on me. And I realized when I joined them in making fun of myself, it, it made it all easy for them and, and for myself. So it's a, it's a twisted way, but hey, uh, at times boys are boys. So at times it may go out humorous like that, but really dementia, when somebody forgets who they are, it's serious. It does not allow them to walk into the fullness of their potential. And so two extremes can exist in dementia. When somebody forgets who they are, they could end up engaging in things that harm themselves or limit their abilities, or they could engage in stuff that harm other people or poses a threat to other people. Um, if you've hung around me for any amount of time listening, you do begin realizing that early on, things that I say that look unrelated are actually laying a very intentional foundation for things that we will borrow from in the message. So please remember that, that in dementia, when somebody forgets who they are, it is of concern, why dementia concerns me, at least in the context of today's message, is because somebody operating from a position of dementia either harms themselves or limits their capacity, or it makes them harm others or become a threat to others. I want you to remember that. These brothers have dementia. They have forgotten who they are. So what if there was spiritual dementia? What if there was spiritual dementia that is making individuals forget who they are? And as a net result, it makes them a threat to themselves and to their potential and their usefulness and makes them a risk to others. What if there was spiritual dementia? Wouldn't we want to deal with it? Wouldn't we want to research it, we didn't we want to have victory over the sin. What's more, again, as I'm always conscious in this week, could it be that the thing that is turning you off from engaging in Christ is because rather is because the example you have been given or you have seen 
of Christianity is not of healthy Christians, but it is, as we will about to see, it is of Christians operating from a position of dementia. So that the version of Christianity you hate is actually nothing more than a misrepresentation of what true Christianity is. I'm even not trying to hide what I'm trying to do, is I'm trying to persuade you why this topic should be important to you as a believer and to you as one who does not subscribe to faith in Christ Jesus. For the believer, if it is true that you are suffering from a variant of spiritual dementia, it should concern you because it means you're harming yourself and you're being a risk to others. If you are not a believer in Christ, it is an invitation for you to reinterrogate your reasons for putting off Christianity because it just might be that the um, sample that you have engaged, interacted, observed that is making you become disinterested in Christianity is not a sample of healthy, normal, proper Christians, but it is a sample of Christians operating from a position of dementia, and therefore you probably are standing back from something that in its, if properly understood, true Christianity if properly understood, away from the confusion that the dementia Christians are bringing, if properly understood, this Christianity and this Christ may be something you want to seriously consider for your life. We'll go to an extremely famous story. It's found in the book of Luke. I'm um, in the Bible book of Luke. Luke is a, uh, most of the writers of the Bible are Jews. Few are not. Luke is one of the non-Jewish um, writers of the, of the Bible. And he is a doctor. So he, his work is a very good compilation. We're li- reading his work at Luke 15, Luke chapter 15. Um, I want to read from verse 11. But I want to read verses 1 and 2 to give immediate context of why the story was said. So Luke reading 15, 1 and 2, and then we will jump to verse 11. Then drew unto him all publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So that's a context within which the next series of stories are told, the story of the lost coin, then there's a story of the lost sheep, and then today we want to focus on the third story, which is famously known as the prodigal son. Reading from verse 11, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to His father, Father, give me, one other version says now, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, There arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went, and this is where King James does not bring it well. King James says, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. A better translation says, and he went and sold himself, or sold his services to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough and to spare, and, and I perish with hunger? Let me read that line again. It will become important. How many hard servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, 
and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And he, the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring him the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And when they began to be merry, now... And they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him safe and sound and he was angry and will not go in therefore came his father out and entreated him and he answering said to his father look this many years do I serve you neither transgressed I any of thy commandments and yet you never gave me a kid that it might that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this your son was come, which has devoured your living with harlots, and has killed, you have killed for him the fattened calf. And he said unto him, Son, you are ever with me, and all that I have is yours. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Profound story. These brothers have dementia. When the story unfolds, the younger son who we famously know as the prodigal son, tells the father, give me the portion of wealth that belongs to me. In, I'm trying to balance. I know there are people online who are not African. I know the dominant people in the immediate audience are Africans. They'll get this very quickly. Middle Eastern culture is like African culture in very many regards. When a son asks for his share of his inheritance from his living father, he is basically telling the father, I wish you were dead. And this is the reason in both cultures, Africa and Middle East, you never quite own, you hold in trust for the next generation. When I go to ask my father for a piece of the family land, I don't ask him for his land. The language I use in my mother tongue is, I want a piece of my grandfather's land. The English Swahili, no other language could bring it well. Mbesom kunda kwakuka just means I want the land of my grandfathers. And this is the understanding. When my father gives me land, it's not my land. 
I'm holding it in trust for the next generation. And land passes from me to the next generation basically at death. Secondly, land was tied up with identity. I, I'm explaining this because we have an online audience. <laughs> the offline audience um, can tell you stories until um, the cows come back home of how many people would go to use machetes to just dispute land borders. Because livelihood was attached to land and identity was attached to land. In the Western Hemisphere, people don't, somebody can easily tell you, I'm from Ohio, and what they basically mean is they've lived in um, Chicago, you know, um, they've, they've lived in one of the cities in that apartment, that's what it means they are from that place. But when you go to the Middle East and when you come to Africa, when I say I am from Luya land, like that's where I come from, it means I have a literal piece of land in Luya land where not only I get my livelihood, but I also get my identity. And so, when a son tells a living father, give me the portion of my wealth that falls to me, what he's really asking for is a lot. He's asking for a father basically to be dead. He's wishing him dead. But he's also asking that the father should cut off a part of his identity, his land, and a part of his livelihood, his land. It was not only a difficult thing to do in that culture, but it was also very humiliating. It was very embarrassing because when you lost a part of your land, you lost part of your standing, part of your clout, and part of your livelihood. It was expected that any son making a claim like what the son has done would be chased away from home, if need be, violently. That is what is expected of a Middle Eastern father. And it's to a good extent also what's expected in Africa. If you begin making these claims, your, your father, if they deem you're not, they can chase you out of home violently, completely, because what you're really wishing is you wish I was dead, you want me to lose my identity, and you, you're just cutting everything off. And so the audience that was listening to Jesus as he tells this story must have been shocked when they hear what the father did. The Bible says the father gave his son it, in, in, in preparing this is when I actually rethought, you know, what that really means is this. In Middle Eastern culture, the elder son got the double portion. He got the double portion. Where this is not a sermon about fairness and equity. Um, so just that's how the culture worked. And so because there were only two sons, at least in this story, the older son would get two-thirds of the land and the younger son would get a third of the land. So imagine the father had to lose a third of his land. I want that to sink in. I want that to sink in really good because you know back home right now, you're waiting for this message to end for you to get on a phone call to dispute a, a land border issue on your phone. And what you're in dispute about is, sorry, those online, we have just used Swahili is migu, yeah? And you're willing to come to death. This father was selling a third, not a foot, a third of his identity, a third of his livelihood was gone. Because there's no other way he would give. Um, he, so he allocates a third and then the son sells it. I want you to walk back into um, I want you to walk back into that scenario because. Every time anybody passes, in fact, it soon become an identity. Where are you going? Aqua, we are going to that person whose, whose son sold off part of his land. That was going to be his identity. Very demeaning. But the father goes ahead and does it. 
The traditional way of telling you this story is to tell you um, everything that happened to the um, first, the younger son, and then come to the end and begin bringing the older son. But I'm going to change it a bit. I'm going to tell you the two stories together. The younger son is very clear. It's very, very clear. He wants the things of the father. He doesn't want the father. Completely. In fact, it's so bad that even after he goes and wastes his substance on riotous living, when he's sitting in the pigsty, he's saying, how many of my father's servants even have bread? So part of the thing driving him to the apology journey is hunger, is what he can get from the father, not the father. The younger son wants the things of the father, but doesn't want the father. In fact, he's wishing the father dead. Are you that younger son? And why is this an act of dementia? It's because the younger son, by doing this, has forgotten who he is. He is a son. He is entitled to what the father has. The father will act in his best interest. He is covered. He's assured he's a son. But one of the things the son, the, the, the younger son's approach will do is that dementia of sin makes him forget the fact he is a son and wants him to run to find his own, to use the father as a source of his own fulfillment without having a relationship with the father. And they ask in love, are you that younger son? Have you forgotten who you are? Are you using God? Now, let me tell you something else about the Middle East culture. Happy that I have Africans here. Just like our culture in Africa, it's a shame and honor culture. You, you know what that means. You, um, every morning when you're tidying up your children and sprucing them up and preparing them for the day, you're busy reminding them you cannot do certain things because they do what? They bring shame to our name. That's a lot of, our, a lot of the behavior that we drive a lot in shame versus honor culture is children don't do certain things because it will bring shame. Hmm, the next example in my head, Holy Spirit, help me. We cover a lot of sins amongst ourselves because exposing them will bring what? Shame. We know Brother X is having an affair with Sister Y so that they can get their immigration papers straightened, but we all will keep what? A code of silence because it will bring what? Shame. We don't quite care that young person A is conveniently married to somebody just to get their visa straightened because when they finally get the papers, we are able to report back home, we are in good status and it will give us honor. It's awfully quiet here. Um, on, um, if you're watching it online at this point, it's awfully quiet in here. So let me speak to you online. What was true in the Middle East has probably moved to our social media spaces. There are a lot of the things driving your TikTok behavior, your Instagram posts, your Twitter tweets, has a lot to do with it get me shame or will it get me what? Honor. Not Will it help humanity or will it glorify God or is it true? But is it shame versus what? Honor. I digress. Now back to all of us. Now in a shame and honor culture like that, when the younger son has done and brought shame like this to the family, it was expected that the older brother, okay, who is the inheritor of the double portion and is going to be the receiver of both the spiritual and then the material blessings of the home, is the one who 
is the chief disciplinarian. He's the one who's meant to go and look for this brother and try and do everything they can to make sure that the shame he has brought to the family is remedied. There is a slight reason why Esau is coming to meet Jacob. One of them, of course, is this revenge on his mind. This, the, 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 it's been years. But Esau is the bigger brother. And he hears that his younger brother, who has done a few shoddy things, is coming back. And the older brother is coming out to seek for the younger brother to straighten out some things beforehand. There is a reason when you read the story in Genesis about the children of Jacob going to buy grain in Egypt. There is a reason why the brothers, Reuben, the biggest brother, when, when, when the youngest brother Benjamin is arrested, he says, take me. It's because in a shame and honor culture, that is what is expected. He says, no, I'm, I am the eldest. I am the one to restore order in this home. So to the to the, to, to the audience listening, which was a Jewish audience, listening to that story, the first odd thing that immediately would have struck them was the fact that the father, rather than rebuking the younger son, did actually go ahead and give him land and sow the son, sell the land and move away and expose himself to so much shame and ridicule. And then the second odd thing that would immediately strike them is the young, the older son in the whole story did nothing to intervene to at least try and redeem the son back. Nothing done. I want that to sink in. The smart ones know where I'm going. But because we're bringing everyone together, let me show you what the stakes were. The younger son has been given a third of the land, he sold it. For the older brother to try and redeem or to go out and look for this son to bring him, it means the older brother would have to dip into his own inheritance, the two-thirds that he's been given, to go out and look for his brother. He would need to suffer that shame, suffer that loss, put at risk himself, move away from his convenience zone, as an older son, as an older brother, and go look for the younger brother. That is what he was expected. But for the older brother, there was too big a cost. In fact, in the story, you see him bickering about not being given a goat. And the father is taken aback and says, but everything I have is yours. That statement was literal. The father, is, the, 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 the father is almost being re made to feel the pain again. He's telling him like, no, look, a third I gave to your younger brother. He sold it. The two thirds remaining is yours. Everything I have is literally yours. You're the one in charge. The older son, just like the younger son, has dementia. He doesn't know who he truly is. But there's a difference between both of them have dementia, but the spiritual dementia is manifested differently. Both of them want the things of the father, but they don't want the father. Remember when the, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the older son says, you've not even given me a kid to eat with my friends. He says, I have served you. And by the way, let me digress here. For a good son who remained home, he knows too much about brothels. Don't you think so? He stayed home. And when, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the errant brother comes back, what does he say? This son of yours has wasted his money on prostitutes. When did he know that? How did he know so much about that way of sin, yet he was supposedly a good guy staying at home? I digress. But just food for thought. And this is what he says to the father. He says, I have kept your commandments. I have done everything you wanted of me, but you've not even given me a goat. So these are two very different. Both of them want the things of the father, but they don't want the father. 
the younger son is trying to achieve that goal by being bad, by being openly bad and rebellious. The older son is trying to achieve the exact same goal by being good, by being compliant, by being obedient. None of them wants the father, but they want the things of the father. One is going to try and get them by being good. The other one is going to try to get them by being bad. And in the process, both of them forget who they truly are. Their sons. Before we go to see how they are cured of this, let me ask you in love, which of these two sons are you? You know choir singing, tithe giving, hymn, hymn humming, Bible quoting, pathfinder marching, believer who's doing everything right. But as a means to get the things of the father. Look at, look at the older son. He's angry. He's angry. Why is he angry? He's angry that the father has entertained the brother. Let me give you context here. And, and hopefully today I'm just encouraging you to see how to read the Bible properly. He's told... And, and you can pick his anger from what he complains about. He says, this son has come. You've given him the fat and calf. I have been with you. You've not even given me a kid. Hey, believer, you know what I'm saying? The, the, the son has reduced an entire relationship to articles of food. But there's more to it. There was no good refrigeration back then. And therefore, big animals like a fattened calf were not normally eaten. It wasn't, you see, for you to eat a whole calf, I mean a whole fattened calf, you needed to be quite a number of people. So the fattened calf was only eaten during special occasions and, and, and the community needed to be invited because that was too much meat. Again, I'll use an African example. For most African cultures, when you go back and see what we ate, we ate a lot of vegetables, we ate a lot of grains. We didn't eat a lot of meat unless you're um, from a fishing community because at least a fish, one family could sit and eat it. But people didn't just slaughter a cow. Even the Maasai who are um, pastoralists don't kill their cows randomly. They may eat, drink the milk, they may mix it with blood and eat, but to slaughter a whole cow is a challenge because after you've eaten, how do you preserve the rest? And so, the older son is bothered that what he sees as his resources, in this case the fattened calf, are being used to try and redeem somebody who in his eyes he deems as, I am better than him. I slow down in love because you know what I'm about to ask. Are you the older son? You begin realizing this story has two prodigal sons. The only difference is one left. The other one remained. One had a prodigal heart. The other one did prodigal things and the prodigal steps and walked away. The younger son comes back to the father and it is very instructive what he asks the father. He says, Father, I have sinned before you and before God. Correct. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Wrong. And then he says this, make me, please notice he doesn't say make me a slave. He says, make me as one of your hired servants. What is happening here? Hired servants are paid. In the way that Jewish culture worked is 
For you to become that kind of a servant, you were put through something like an apprenticeship. So you began becoming an expert in one area or the, or the other. And through the apprenticeship, you're then able to earn and repay whatever you needed to. So what the younger son is really asking for when he's come back is this. Dad, can we make an arrangement where I can work, I can pay, I can repay you. I know I have messed, but I figure out the only way I can solve this thing is if I find out a way to repay you. And the only formula he could think of is, let me be hired to earn to repay you. That's really what he's asking. Dementia. He's forgotten who he is. You are a son, not by performance. You are a son because you were born a son. And that is why when he comes with his speech, his formula for how to be made right with the father, the father listens none of that. Please notice what the father says. He says, bring him the best robe. The best robe would be the father's robe. Because he was the owner of the estate at that point, he was the eldest, the best robe was not the older son's robe, it was the father's robe. The father is basically saying, give this guy the best. He, 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 he is not thinking straight, he has dementia, he's forgotten who he is. I need things to remind him who he is, give him my robe. And he says, put a ring. The son had sold everything, the ring had to come from the father. In other words, in a few minutes in that party, everything you are seeing on the prodigal son came from and belonged to the father. But his initial dementia was trying to earn those things rather than just come and surrender that his father would be able to do those things in him. Let me slow down and ask in love and sit here. Both of these sons have dementia. They've forgotten who they are. They are sons. They are heirs. They are safe. But because their dementia has made them want the father's things without wanting the father, one of them has pursued a channel or a track of trying to achieve that agenda by being outrightly rebellious, it has brought them to a place where they have lost everything. It has brought them back to a place where they imagine that the only way to reclaim or get back is if they are able to figure a way to pay their way back. And it is very clear they can't. It's brought them to a place where they are empty and in a pigsty. The other son, who has remained, has also forgotten who he is, that he is a son, that he is a heir, that he is with the father, and everything the father has is his. And his approach to try and get the things of the father is by being good and doing the right things and obeying and complying. What that in result has done is it has made him angry at grace. Anytime he sees grace being extended to another person, he becomes angry about it because he feels they have not earned it. As a result, he is dwelling in abundance, but living with scarcity. The father has to even be almost shocked and tell him, but everything I have is yours. What's more, he dishonors his father. The father has made a party and has invited all the neighbors. By the eldest son, the heir, refusing to attend the party and doing his refusal publicly, he's dishonoring the father. Look at the language he speaks to the father. When the father tells him to come in, he, he begins his answer by, look. 
That's one of the other places where reading the Bible in my mother tongue brings it better. The, the, the rudeness comes out very quickly. When I want to tell somebody in my mother tongue, look, I tell them anger. And when you, when you begin a statement in my mother tongue with the word anger, it means, first of all, I'm treating you either as a peer or below me. And secondly, I'm so livid, I want you to listen to me. I cannot tell my own mother or my own father, even now, anger. Look. But this son is so angry that he dishonors his father by not attending the party. He also dishonors the father with how he speaks to his father in public. Hey, 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 fellow believer, you know what I'm saying. Your religion doesn't want God for God. It wants God for the things you can get from him. And when, and, and, and life many of the times is not going the way we want, maybe just for short periods at a time. And so in those periods, we are very tempted to operate and vent our anger either on God or vent our anger towards people. We bring that spirit, the one from my mother tongue, anger. Look. We try and make the faith experience as difficult for everyone because we don't understand what it means to be truly happy and joyful in the Lord. This son has served with moroseness and the closeness and pity all along, forgetting that everything the father has is his. And when he sees the father doing what he ought to have done, gone out to look for the son, when he sees the father doing what he ought to have done, sacrificed so that he can look out for his brother, he's upset. These two sons want the things of the father, but they don't want the father. I'm inviting you to think about your prayer life. A true Christian repents for two things. A true Christian repents for the things they've done wrong. They've coveted, they've stolen, they've lied, they've borne false witness. They, co they, they, they confess for what they've done. But they also confess about the motives behind the things they've done well. Let me repeat that again. A true Christian not only recognizes that the things that need to be confessed in their life are the things they have done wrong, the open wrong things. A true Christian also recognizes that often they need to confess to God about the motives for the seemingly correct or positive things they have done. A true Christian's motivation for prayer is not the things they want from God, but it is God. And ask in love, when you come to God, are you seeking him for him? Or are you seeking him for the things you can get from him? Do you have dementia? Are you operating forgetting that you're a son? And is it leading you to either open rebellion or angry servitude? Are you a prodigal who has walked away or are you a prodigal who just remained behind? Look at what the father has to do because of the behavior of both sons. Because of the younger son, the father has to open himself to risking his livelihood and to open shame. When the son is coming back, the father has to do things a Middle Eastern man does not do. Neither do even most African men do. Number one, he, he runs in public, in broad daylight. You know they wear robes 
And so for that to, for him to run, he has to lift up the robes and the Middle Eastern man does not expose his legs in public. Children could run, women could run, but the man, the patriarch of the home did not run. But because of the younger son, the father does that. And one could even argue because of the failure of the older brother, the father has to run to meet the son who should in the first place have been looked out for by his older brother. I slow down in love again and ask, as I invite you to think about the motives of your prayer, and for that my brother, my sister, who has disengaged from Christianity or has held it at arm's length, might it be then, by this point you're beginning to realize, wait a minute, the thing that has turned me off from Christianity is not what true Christianity is, because the only true Christian in this picture is the father, and we're coming to him shortly, but the thing that has turned you off from Christianity is either the Christians who have tried to get what they want from God through open rebellion, or the other guys who try to get things from God by being angry yet obedient. I invite us that the cure to the dementia of the two sons was the father and what he did. Number one, this is what the father did to cure them. The sons would be cured through the loving action of the father. It's a father who runs to the younger son. It is a father who comes out from the party to talk to the older son. It is the father who apportions them um, the inheritance. It is the father who commands that the son be robed and ringed and sandaled and that a party be thrown in his behalf. It is the father who hugs and kisses. It is the father who does this. In the Christian teaching, I'm happy that we have not just a father, True big brother. The big brother in, in Luke 15 was more concerned about his inheritance that he was not willing to risk any of it to go and restore the shame and the honor that had come upon the family. But in the Christian narrative, we have a genuine big brother who sacrificed everything, including heaven itself where angels call his name and they fall prostrate. He sacrificed all of that and made the treacherous journey to come and try and make a difference to redeem you and me. That big brother is called Jesus. Within the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we have a group called the Pathfinder. One of the things we say in Pathfindering is, the love of God constrains me or compels me. And the next part of that verse says, because knowing that one person died, that all may live. That's what is the genuine spring of action in true Christianity. Yes, in true Christianity, we can ask for a spouse and God will give. We can, we can ask for wisdom and God will supply. We can ask for wealth and God will give us strength to be able to get it. But the true wellspring of Christianity is not the things we can get from God, but the thing we have already got from him, which is his love. And that this love drives us to a position where the ultimate thing we are pursuing is not what we can get from this God of love, but the ultimate quest of our lives then becomes to be able to draw nearer to this God of love. In the words of a songwriter, it says, more about Jesus I would know, more of his saving fullness know, more of his um, love to others show, more of this love who died for me, more, more about Jesus. The father attempts to cure the sons from the dementia of not knowing who they are, number one, by his loving action to them. 
Number two, the father tries to cure the sons from the dementia by showing them both the fault in their approach. You see, in church, we have individuals who will teach that for you to be righteous, you need to earn it. There'll be other people who will teach liberality, that God doesn't care what you do. You're already saved. Both parties are wrong. In real life, the independent liberal people who don't believe in faith believe that the close-minded religious people are the ones in the wrong. They are like the prodigal son. Meanwhile, the hyper-religious people um, believe that their actions and their words are what will earn them merit with God. Christ in this parable tells them they're wrong. Remember, we read um, Luke 15, 1, 2, 3, and Jesus was addressing publicans and tax collectors who would be like the open prodigal son. These were individuals whose sin was public. They extorted, they stole, they did everything that was wrong publicly. And then he was also addressing the Pharisees and the scribes whose external behavior was what looked appropriate, but whose internal motivations was because they were doing the behavior to earn favor from God. And therefore, God is addressing the Pharisees and the scribes through the behavior of the older son. So Jesus, in his story, shows that the father tries to cure the two sons from their dementia of forgetting who they are by showing them the fault of their ways. He shows the older son that his fixation on correctness of behavior has made him to come to a religion that is angry. A religion that does not recognize what God has given in him. A religion that is not willing to sacrifice so that he might genuinely get the lost. A religion that is all about conserving what they have rather than taxing it for the sake of the lost. And he tells him that no, your religion that is trying to win my things through the correctness of your actions is not only wrong, but it is also ultimately impossible. And Christ simultaneously looks to the liberals in church and looks at the people out there who are saying faith has no point in life and begins telling them that their waywardness and their rebellion and their everything that is astray away and hinged from God's morality is actually wrong. But that the central saving morality is not what man can do to attain eternal life, but it is how man can accept what Christ has already done for the sinner. The son is accepted into the party not with his own robes that he'd come with from the pigsty. He did not ask to be accepted in the party in his own terms. He is accepted in the party while wearing the father's robe, while wearing the father's ring, while wearing the father's shoes, because that is what qualifies him for fitness into the party. But please notice, he did not earn them. They were given to him. Thereafter, he would need to walk according to what it means to be a son. Remember, he had come with his own formula of, can I work for you, dad, and earn money, and with it probably repay you? And the father knows this son has dementia. He's forgotten who he is. You cannot rebuy sonhood. You receive sonhood. It is only in Christianity that we receive a justification. We do not earn it. But only as we walk along with our own dementia that forgets this idea, do we try to manufacture our own righteousness. And the end result is we create sons who are rebellious like the younger son, or we create sons who are rigidly bitter like the older son. The father comes to plead with the older son, and he's trying to make it clear to him, son, I want you in the party. I value that you should be in the party. 
I am still desirous that all I have should be yours. The sons are shown the error of their way and they are shown the goodness of their father as a means to cure them from the dementia that has made them forget who they truly are. In their sin, they have exaggerated their sense of importance. The older son believes he is way more important than the way he is being treated. The younger son initially felt he was too important for home. And when he comes back the second time, he believes he is too insignificant for home. Both of them in their extreme views are wrong. The father sees them both through the lens, I sired you. You are my sons, you are precious, not because of anything that you can attach to yourselves, but because I want you. Yes, to enter my party, you'll need my robes. Yes, to, 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 to fit within my setting, you'll need an adjustment of your attitudes. But until you can see the folly of your ways, you will not be willing to come into my audience chamber. The father tries to cure the sons by a loving reach to them. The father tries to cure the sons by showing them the folly of their ways. And the father tries to cure the sons by reminding them the expense it takes to save them. The fattened calf has to die so that a son might be celebrated. The father has to expose himself to ridicule and to risk his livelihood so that a young son can be able to have a third of his inheritance. A father has to run in public and expose himself to public shame so that a young son can be reaccepted. A father has to step out from entertaining his guests and expose himself to the public ridicule of being scorned by his elder son who will not get into the party for an older and a younger son to be redeemed. The father is trying to reach to both of the sons by showing them the ultimate sacrifice that it will take to win them back. Pause with me and just think of Gethsemane. Jesus has spent the night toiling with his own human nature and toiling with the suggestions of the devil to give up. The inner turmoil, Paul puts it this way, he says, he who knew no sin had been made sin, not a sinner. He'd been made the very thing God hated. He had been made sin. And now here he is in the garden and just envision him clawing the ground on fours, his knees and hands on the ground. His human nature so dilapidated, he's sought help from his disciples and in exasperation after coming back and forth and finding them asleep, he asks them, couldn't you pray with me one hour? He finds himself increasingly separated from God and now even his very own human friends cannot be with him even for a single hour. Imagine him sweating those agonizing drops of blood as the internal turmoil began revealing externally through this extraordinary feat of human stress. See him looking at those lights making their way into the garden and at the front the unmistakable figure of Judas leading and coming and betraying him in the most disgusting manner possible with a kiss. A kiss is an instrument of friendship and fraternity and acceptance and Judas is using this article of friendship in an act of betrayal. See him walking through the mockery of a trial. He who had inspired the Jewish judiciary system is now standing in it as he's seeing every article of it being flaunted so that a human agenda inspired by the devil can be floated through. See him sitting in that cold cell and see him listening to the crowd being asked whether they wanted a known insurrector Barabbas or they wanted him. 
and the crowd electing Barabbas over him. See him being whipped, the Roman whips, and coming down. And in, 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 in the words of inspiration, the cross being placed on him three times and three times he collapses under its weight. See him being bereft of energy to the point that he has to be supported by a dark arm of Simon of Cyrene all the way to the elected spot of death called Golgotha. See them gambling for his clothes and see them choosing the rusty pieces of metal to put in his limbs as they affix him to the death where he will die partly of asphyxiation but largely from a broken heart. See him doing all of that and in his dying words all he can say is, Father, forgive them. And when you think of this ultimate cost paid for you, how many kilos of soya do you want to eat for you to gain acceptance? Do you feel the mockery Jesus should endure when you begin equating your redemption with articles of food? See this that he has gone and think about your rebellion that is putting you in nightclubs and all these other places. How much more could he do to redeem you? The father just like Jesus has endured all of these things to communicate one thing. You're precious. I will go to all costs possible to take your shame so that you can have my glory. I will go to all costs to take your sin so that you can have my righteousness. I'm going to all this length to take your death so that you can have my life. Because I am not like the bigger brother. I am the true elder brother. And in the words of the song, he says, how can you look into those tear-stained eyes? Knowing well that it is you he is thinking about. Will you say I'm not ready? Or will you prioritize your own righteousness or your own rebellion? Will your dementia of forgetting who you truly are called to be in Christ hold you from seeing the ultimate price it took to win you back to reconciliation with God? I wish the story ended well. It did end with a younger son in the party, but it ended with the older son unwilling to enter the party. But you know what? The story of your life can end differently because God has given you one tool. It's called choice. You could either continue living your life under the dementia of rebellion or the dementia of self-works. And both lead to not nice places. Or you could respond to the loving approaches of God. You could see the folly of your ways. You could appreciate the sacrifice it takes to restore you to wholeness. And when you come to the father, he will tell you the same words he told the older son. Everything I have, son. Is yours. You're a son. You're mine. Somebody tonight needs to give up the dementia. It could be one, it could be two, who realize the way they have been living their Christian life, their Christians, their believers, is on the axis of the younger son. They want the things of God, they don't want God. And the way they are trying to get them is by being rebellious. Because God didn't answer my prayer last time, I'm not coming to church. Because God didn't heal my mother, I'm going to drink. Because God didn't make my children come up well, I'm going to speak badly about the church. And they realize it doesn't go to a good place. And then there are others who are trying to get the things of God by just trying to be as holy as they can be. And you know deep in your heart you're angry. 
You're angry because life is not always going the way you want. You're angry because you're seeing God extending grace and mercy to people you believe you are better than. You're angry and a poor representation of Christ. You're angry and at risk of dishonoring God and being out there and it's all working. And you want to say tonight with me, Sire, I want what the Father has for me. His righteousness, his experience for me. Is there any one person in the auditorium? And if you're online, you're also part of this. Any person in the auditorium who's saying, I am a victim of dementia. I have lived out my Christian experience, forgotten who I am. But tonight, but tonight, I need help. And I want to rise to my feet as an indication of that. If there's one person in the auditorium, please stand to your feet saying, I realize my dementia and I need God's help. And if you're online and you're doing the same, please, whichever of the social media platforms you're watching this from, please do drop a line. Someone will be in touch with you to make a follow-up about this. Sorry for that. But finally, tonight is a good night for one person, for two people who've either not accepted Jesus into their lives to do so. And we have the additional chance to have you demonstrate your willingness to walk with Jesus through the waters of baptism. And I want to give this final minute to you. You may be here, you may be online, and what you're saying is, God, I want to accept Jesus, to be Lord and Savior of my life, and at an opportune time to demonstrate that decision through waters of baptism. If you're online, again, you can indicate your desire for baptism through the comments and someone will be in touch with you. If you're in the auditorium, will you be brave enough to step forward and we can have the final prayer with you here. Again, I'll hold this for the next 50 seconds, 10 seconds already gone. And the request is simple. I have dementia, spiritual, and our desire to be baptized sometime soon. Please join me to the front. We have 40 more seconds for that. And when the 40 seconds are done, we will pray. Now, some friends have asked me why I don't give scary stories or plead more with people. And I want to say this. I was baptized when I was 16, no, 15. I should have been baptized when I was 14. I'd gone through, but hey, I said, can I have one more year to, to, to just study these things? And for more now than two decades after being baptized, I realized that the Christian walk is more than the initial fear. It's a real walk. It is best entered when you're clear-minded. It is best entered as exactly that, as a decision. Oh, it's a decision I don't regret. I've made many decisions in life that I would regret, but the one I'm certain I don't regret is a decision to be a Christian. So I'll not tell you frightening stories. I'll not try to guilt trip you. I'll not even try to tell you like what will happen or will not happen to you if you're not giving yourself to the Lord today. But what I will say to you is this. History is abundant with examples of what happens to people who show their back to Jesus. It doesn't go well with them. And your own testimony of your own life knows, knows, it knows, it knows that it is not well with you. And that the problem is not your suicidal thoughts, it's not your drinking problem, those are symptoms. The deeper problem is you've walked away from Jesus, you've never come to him, and you're trying to justify yourself through hard work, or justifying yourself through tough rebellion. And it needs to end, and you need to be baptized. In our final 20 seconds, and I'm pleading with you, you're standing up or indicating otherwise on Facebook or, or 
YouTube, that you need prayers to overcome your dementia, you're coming forward in the final 10 seconds to say, I want to accept Jesus in my life and I want to be baptized. Our heads are bowed, amen. Our eyes are closed as we pray. Sovereign Father, dementia makes us hurt ourselves and it makes us be a risk to others. Our spiritual dementia makes us hurt ourselves because forgetting that we are your children, we then become preoccupied with how do we get your things rather than how do we get you. And in the process, O oh Lord, we create an atmosphere similar to that of the older son and that of the younger son. Savior, forgive us. Really and genuinely forgive us. And loving God, thank you. Because you're the one who comes running to us. You're the one who hugs us. You're the one who kisses us and dresses us and rings us and sandals us and throws a party for us. Thank you for all the loving pursuit you've done in our lives. Through songs, through teachers, through preaching, through the events of life, through providence, thank you for pursuing us with love. Thank you, Lord, because of showing us the emptiness and the folly of our elected path, of either rebellion or of performance. And loving Father, as we contrast its emptiness with the fulfillment we can find in you, may you help us bring an end to our forgetfulness on you and come Lord to begin living what we to be sons and daughters in Christ and loving father when the things of life tries to make these things fade remind us the ultimate sacrifice that it took Christ to do to earn us this right to be yours and loving father for the individual who is either at the brink of making a decision for you and to demonstrate it in baptism. I pray, Lord, you may keep tugging away at their heart. You may keep removing the objections and you may keep removing the obstacles. And loving Father, may they settle in the truth as it is in Christ. And may they be persuaded to be yours ever, only, and always. Take us home safely, I pray. Help us reminisce on these words and may its impact and implication in our life be true. God, bring us back again safely and with a desire and will to hear of you and do your will. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. God bless you.